Now it's visible. You okay. can proceed. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I have to say that doesn't matter how many years, for how many years you present your research and how many times a year, uh, it's always an, uh, an, it's always a stress and because you always want to produce something new and you want to share something new and it requires from you to rethink your own um, presumptions, even the things you believed in. And this actually has been the case with me for this presentation. So I really, really enjoy uh, sharing my ideas because they, I hope they will communicate something useful to everyone. But they, the very exercise of presenting, uh, it's a challenge every time. And it's contributing to my own knowledge. So I wanted to talk about um, innovation in... Um, Support in innovation in research to support um, teaching English as a foreign second or whatever language in uh, 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 in, in our um, current 21st century context. So um, I wanted to focus it quite nicely um, today, and I I started the presentation wondering if we want to do innovation, we have to have ideas, and I wondered. Where do ideas come from, right? Because innovation means bringing something in and then reorganizing things so that we can come up with something new and test it and so on. So I was wondering if we were to bring something new in, where do we get it from? Where do we bring it in from? Let's have a look how the presentation uh, develops. So I had a PhD student, she's finished by now, she's happy. She's really happy now. She just finished, I think, a couple months ago. And she did research on teaching research skills to undergraduate students uh, in Indonesia, future teachers of English. And she found this book by uh, Professor Gary Thomas. And Gary Thomas, as you can see, he's comfortably sitting there. He has been a quite prominent figure when it comes to education research. And um, so I've put his credentials up there. And um, he's very critical of educational research. And I might actually read us what he is saying. So uh, I took this text from my PhD student's uh, thesis. Um, played with it a little bit. And what Professor, according to Professor Garrett Thomas, he thinks there is a stagnation in education research, which means not much innovation. And there is reliance on compliance rather than critique, or innovation is somewhat a critique. And this process begins early in one's research career. And he says in research training courses, which is exactly what my student was doing her PhD on research training courses. How do we actually bring in innovation? And he says, you have to do it early on. So as Professor Gary Thomas claims, research training does not teach how to be innovative. Instead, it tends to operate as a regulatory body, ensuring that dissent is increasingly rare and that, stu and that studies are based on evidence supported by hundreds of references. That's resting squarely in the middle lane of orthodoxy, right? If you do everything that everybody else has said, so kind of like there's nothing new coming in. Uh, throughout his publications, Thomas argues against canonization in research and for less orderly ways of thinking. He says, most advanced most advance in thought and practice comes not from paying due regard to what is established from conforming to correct procedure, it comes from the dismissal of that existing, existing thought from rapture rather than conformity. So people who know me from Facebook, I, I just, I, for some reason I've acquired quite a following, they pretty much comfortable now with these uh, statements from me because I've been thinking similar things as Professor Thomas, we need a little bit innovation and we need to rethink how we actually nurture innovation. 
So um, I will obviously bring in my research here and the research with my PhD students to exemplify some things. But if you wouldn't mind, even take the 10 seconds that I take between slides, you might scribble for yourselves on a piece of paper and wonder what intellectual innovations can you think of in English language pedagogy? In other words, what's new? Now, I've been told that language pedagogy is now kind of a pejorative term. I don't know how. So people now call it learning science. I just think we know we don't have to give ourselves air. Let's just do the pedagogy right. But I put the learning science there just to comfort people who think that pedagogy is uh, doesn't have enough air about it. Then, obviously, I ask myself the question, the Internet has been with us for more than 20 years. Actually, I've used it for 35 and some people even earlier. So why, are we caught? why have we been caught by surprise with COVID? Right. So we all know that a lot of schools and a lot of even universities have been caught, especially when it comes to language teaching. You know, we, we were there, we had, we had these uh, lecture rooms and, and, and classes and we could feel our students, we could touch them. And now we can't touch them, we can't feel them. How are we going to manage this? And I'm asking myself, why were we so reliant on face to face? Was it correct? What made it correct? I'm asking myself these things. So. We've been told for many decades now that you've got to know your students. You've got to know your students. And I'm always wondering if we have to know our students, what would that mean? What would that mean? I also ask myself when our discipline knows perfectly well that texts are words organized by grammar and used in cultural settings, what's there to learn in terms of being a researcher, um, I get pretty often statement. I mean, I hear it from many people. Uh, so basic, and this is not to be critical of anyone who does it too. It's just to now start breaking it a little bit. As the professor before me said, sometimes you have to unlearn. And to unlearn, you have to break things. You have to identify some tensions and break them or loosen things a little bit to let other things come in. So I ask myself if texts are organized by grammar and and um, <clears throat> and using cultural context, and so what's there to learn? We know everything, but then I ask myself, well, then we don't actually learn know anything about the learner. We just know everything about the text. Well, not everything probably, but we're talking about text. So there are numerous books written about the acquisition of uh, vocabulary, acquisition of grammar. We know the, all the second language acquisition theories, and they all are about how the learner um, acquires that particular system, that particular linguistic feature. But that's the feature of the text. It tells us nothing about the student. So the question is, what is it that we know about the student? And where do we get this information from? So I think that whatever I present from now on, it just doesn't matter. I think that question, what do we know about the student and where do we get this information from? This is where <clears throat> I would have left my PhD student now to go home and think and answer that question himself or herself, because I wouldn't want to preempt it. I wouldn't want to give him my answer. So I think that's pretty much that question pretty much frames where I would like the field of second language teaching, be it English or any other language, uh, to actually orient itself. So I will show you what I do and what I do uh, with my students. Um, and my colleagues, the ones that I work with, um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that that's what you should do. It's just the path I took to answer my own questions. So uh, most of, my th of the things that I publish are on the research gate. 
So there are these two papers, Hey, have a die flag, because they contain a lot of information that I will be sharing with you today, but not all of it, because obviously every day, uh, every month, every so many months, you know, I update things and present them differently and think of them differently. So where do I get my information from? And I want to introduce you to those different sources of information because I have no doubt that some of you are just like me, are addicts to the YouTube and you watch things on YouTube. But the question then later on is, so what do I do with it? So I will go there shortly. But first of all, so what do we know uh, about the student and now where do I get the information from? Well, I'm looking partly, I'm looking into different sources, but let's today stop with neuroscience. We know that there is a huge fl uh, flourishing of neurosciences uh, in the last 20 years or 25 years because of the new technologies. We can actually see and um, have evidence about a lot of ways in which the human brain processes information. So that's been very interesting. Here we can see that the input comes to the eye, but the eye doesn't see the input. This is very interesting because a lot of uh, uh, research in, in, in English um, learning had been on what input do we present? What do we do for people to notice, right? Well, clearly research here says they won't see anything unless it's relevant to them, unless it's relevant to them. So that personal experience and the top-down systems that actually uh, orient a person person's attention to signals are the dominant ones, not the one that we think, it's the one that the student thinks, right? So if you sometimes feel that you're talking to a wall, you are. <laughs> so that's very interesting. Now, the, the prof Professor Anil Seth is extremely famous and the lecture is from the Royal, Royal Institution, so it's not something that I pulled out from an ambiguous research and maybe not necessarily that prestigious. All these slides are from number one scholars in the world. I used the lecture here from Jordan Peterson on uh, Professor Jordan, they were professors, from Professor Jordan Peterson on um, how we learn. And, and you can see that the, at the minute of one hour, 11th minute, he actually talks about it quite well. Um, but the research obviously is not his, and the research is, comes from no one else, but actually Professor V.S. Ramachandran, one of the key, if not the key neuroscientists in the world. So uh, we have this, uh, two, these two uh, hemispheres, and even though people will argue about what, which hemisphere does what and whatever, but prototypically they have two different functions. One is the one that actually enables us to learn, which is the right hemisphere, the unhappy hemisphere, because it goes like into a shock. Oh my God, how do I do it? I don't know. And the left hemisphere is the happy hemisphere, generates all the answers. So uh, clearly this even if we were to stop thinking about it now, it tells us, well, we need to actually, if we want to learn, if we want our students to learn, we have to, we have to begin with a challenge, something that actually sends a child into this shock, like, oh my God, how do I do that? So I looked there and studied it a lot and took notes from uh, Jordan Peterson's lecture. And you know, when I listened to him, I thought I understood it. Then when I was taking notes, I didn't understand it and I had to hear it like 20 times. And I think that that's something that a lot of my PhD students don't appreciate. Some, I mean, they appreciate after I talked about it and I learned it from someone else as well. Anyway, people very rarely understand that we can't understand things at first hearing or on the first reading, right? Sometimes you actually have to in, um, take notes and in that sense, look at the same text by different, but differently, right? And then you check whether your text is coherent. Then when you talk to your students, then all of a sudden you don't understand what you wrote, right? So all, we need to engage all these many senses to actually make sense of something that actually seems so simple, but it isn't. So I looked also into the studies on culture, but um, 
I'm not sharing with you um, those slides. I actually am sharing uh, with you uh, research on cognition and analogy by, um, <clears throat> I think I can't see the guy's name. Um, doesn't matter. You can go to the Stanford channel and find the analogy as the core cognition. And the scientist here, the professor here, very nicely explains to us that words don't have meaning. Words don't have a meaning by reference, right? So a car is not that object, the car you say. Car is many things, right? So the, the, so the meaning is not through reference, but through the difference, right? Through difference, it, it's deferred. So a hub, as he explains, is the wheel, is the airline, is the company, is, is the... It's the rolling thing, it's the mobility, it's so many things come together to actually generate the concept of the hub. And somewhere, I can't remember anymore where, I found this um, picture um, of a child that when we actually have how linguistics sees the world, which is, you know, you've got to learn your grammar, you've got to not learn your vocabulary, but the child's world is not just those skeletal items. It's connected, it's colorful. There are emotions, there are experiences, there are multisensory memories, right? And we just say, just do your punctuation, do your things, right? So there is this discrepancy. And, and I thought that the picture quite nicely uh, captured that this is how the teacher sees the world and this is how I see the world. So it's um, then also emotions, right? So uh, emotions, we, we don't mean uh, by, um, in reference to words, we mean to experience, in relation to experiences, and, and those experiences are actually emotionally informed. And they're not just emotionally informed, you actually have bodily experiences um, that ex enable you to make sense in a more profound way from your experience. So, so when you think of thirsty, I do, you know, you might think of some sort of situation. I think of two. I literally will never forget them. One when I was nine and I was in a situation where if I didn't drink now, I'll just die. And another one is obviously training. If you exercise, there are moments when you just need a sip of water, right? So our, our emotions, um, so our experiences and our memories are emotionally embedded and those emotions are actually inscribed on our bodies. What do you do with all of that when it comes to learning English? And that's what I would like to answer today. Some of you might be sitting on YouTube and might be finding all this information and going really like excited. Um, this is riveting for a moment. And then when it comes to making the bridge to language teaching, like, what do I do with it? And we end up teaching the grammar and the vocabulary and all of that um, and try to contextualize it a little bit and innovation is not happening. And then when we get a PhD student, we just say, well, change the context in which you teach grammar, vocabulary and all of that. So the, the, the object um, of our concern is not the student and how the student processes information. The object is whether the structures that we value and we inherit from linguistics somehow can be uh, appro appropriated by the student. And without, however, no the knowledge of the student, it's really difficult for us to know whether what we're doing actually has any basis in what neuroscience tells us about who we are and how we process information. Maybe the questions we ask, which is, how to teach grammar or how to teach vocabulary or how to teach culture. Maybe these questions are actually wrong. They've been with us for so long. Here it is, Gary Thomas, right? Let's align with Gary Thomas and say, why don't we just for at least one PhD project or for one project that we get funded for, why don't we just dump those questions into the bucket, you know, the rubbish basket and actually come up with a question like, um, what is it? What is it? What is it that we would like our students? Um, what questions should we ask so that to enable our students um, have better experiences in uh, learning experiences in the context of their English learning? Oh, this is another one. This is the aesthetics by Ramachandran and another one that he produced, right? So he says we have these 
loads of aesthetics, loads of aesthetic experience. And he comes up with a series of them. The pictures you can see here, they're all from his lecture. And I watched it in 2015. And like, you know, I'm sitting in front of my screen, scrolling through all these neuroscience lectures, probably the same way that most of you would be interesting, but so what? But then I had this, you know, the light bulb moment. Um, if he talks about art, aesthetics is art, and communication is like a painting, it's like art too. And I, right, so because you can produce a beautiful text, bad text, the text that actually resonates with people, the text that doesn't. And I thought, oh my God, there must be something in it for uh, uh, teaching. So I will show you something. So this is another thing, you know, so uh, we, um, importance of rhythm. We all know that, you know, we, 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 every culture has its own rhythm. So, and people walk even differently. Have you ever followed someone uh, who was maybe from a different culture? So you notice that people, some people walk slower, some people walk faster, some people like the French walk always stiff and so on. So, you know, there's a rhythm and we pronounce things. Intonation has a rhythm. What do you do with that? So what do I do with it? I might actually introduce you to a few ideas and they shouldn't actually, you, you may follow them. You may actually grab the research that I just presented and expand it or just look at those things and maybe produce your own different interpretations of how to work with it, right? So I'm continuously um, repeating myself so that you don't see yourself uh, um, depend on my solutions, right? So you don't, you don't depend on my solutions. You just build your own process and you have to be brave, right? We, we, we sit on Facebook and we know it took 999 wrong solutions to bulb, light bulb, to find the right one, right? So you can see here that's an English class. <laughs> Right, so some of it you can relate to the computers and people having their headphones, so you can probably relate to it. But in uh, one, one of the classes where the students are walking, you can see it's in China. So why are they walking? Why are all the kids standing? Right, so the, here on the left you have, um, I think the school students, or maybe you know, yeah, the university students, sorry. And on the right, the Indonesian students, they are second year students. Again, standing there, clapping, doing all these things, right? That's an English class. Standing there, walking around the classroom, they are actually learning English. So I um, just wanted to show you that sometimes you actually can do uh, what, the, what the professor before me said, that they're not boring things, that are uh, not conventional things, and actually you still actually uh, enable students to learn English. So let's talk about it. So. What we decided that because the person is actually in charge of their own experiences and in charge of what actually talks to them, we decided that uh, because it's not the, the, the framework of thinking is not just on the mind. So the people around me, like Professor Andrew Lyle and myself, we decided that we will not teach English so much as we will think of activities and design tools that enable students to self-organize. So you've heard the concept of, uh, of self-organization and what it means is not to, uh, not necessarily that, you know, explicit teaching is not bad, there's a room for that too, but basically what we're after is actually enabling students to self-organize. They detect the things that uh, matter to them. So we were thinking of identifying tools that enable students to engage these multi-sensory processes in terms of which they organize themselves in the world and in this time in the world of English. So how can we sti stimulate all this thinking and the feeling and the motor movements, right? So when you move, you move in English, you, know, you don't move in French uh, if you are French, because if you're learning English, you, have, you, you, sh you adjust your body and your breathing to the rhythm of English so that you are a little bit more intelligible. So we're thinking, what the heck can we do? So we got all these principles from neuroscience. So how can we actually enable students to self-organize and do so in the multi by engaging their multi multi multiple senses? 
So we clearly have the students involved in projects. That's what gives them the focus, right? Whatever they do, they do it in order to uh, do their projects well. Uh, people talk about project-based learning. I like when the projects are actually integrated in the community, into the community. So I talk about the community-based learning because the community brings you reasons to um, how you, uh, you can uh, modulate your presentation, how you can uh, you can also reflect on whether you're actually addressing people well or not. I, this is not the subject of my talk today, so I'll just skim, skip through this. So we taught, uh, one, of, one of my students actually was doing academic writing in Indonesia, and these students actually had uh, all the resources for, um, that we, all the tools for self-organization, we actually created them and we put them all online. So students could actually work uh, individually or on groups and sometimes in class, but the resources that we created for them to utilize those tools for um, processing information in a multi-sensory way in order to stimulate self-organization in English or in relation to English, we put it all online. They had all that stuff there. Some of, some of my students very often don't know what's a resource. So this is a typical resource. Actually, I, this is one of the very nice resources created by one of my literacy students. And I'll just show you three slides so you can actually get an idea what I mean by resources. Uh, so these are the sort of uh, materials that, that teachers create to enable students to actually um, work through the material by themselves or in groups, discuss, uh, and then um, utilize it in order to generate a product relevant for their project. So here we go. This is quite nice, actually. So. The student here, in, because it was my literacy student, she wants children to be uh, to, to tell the difference between the newspaper and a, and a um, scientific report. So she is looking at the scientific um, text. So it has a title. It uh, oh, it's not coming through here very nicely. So um, it has a subtitle very often. Not all of it is coming up. So it has headings. Um, it's not visible very well, but doesn't matter. I'll take you through it. It has short paragraphs. It has a table. When we, have, when we look at the newspaper, on the other hand, we have a big title, but we don't have subtitle, right? We don't have headings. We don't have short paragraphs. We have long paragraphs. We, ha we don't have a table. We have a photograph instead, right? To, for, for people, to, for readers to relate to human faces, we have a caption and so on. So that was one of the, so that's a concept of a resource, right? So we would use that kind of resource, adjust it obviously, to draw students' attention to differences in genre, right? So now that in a, in a multi-sensory way by comparing uh, explanations about the text, compare, using the visuals, uh, students and, and maybe also um, this, integrating discussions about it. Students can actually see in a more multi-sensory way the difference between a scientific report and um, and the newspaper. And then they can actually compare this resource with objects, uh, real objects, and, and then discuss how the resource helped them to understand and what other questions they may raise. In terms of rhythm and feel, uh, my, 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 my PhD students usually utilize um, what's called the verbal tonal method. This is, I will not go into it, but it doesn't matter. Basically, what we do, we improve students' pronunciation and with it, what all research has shown, multiple studies have shown now, that uh, so it's a research mainly done by Professor Andrew Lyon, but basically he utilizes intonation and he plays with, he modulates intonation in such a way that for different speakers of different languages, he creates different filtered versions of, of sentences. And students then actually try to imitate, but as they imitate what they hear, what they do, the sentences that they repeat in a sort of behavioristic way, they're not behavioristic, they actually stimulate their self-organization and they also are you know, invited to walk to the rhythm of what they hear, you know, to clap to what they think they hear and all of that. So they actually experience English music or the, the music of English of, of the English language across their body, throughout their body, not just by re reproducing it in their mouth, through their mouth. So it's very, so they, they, they have these series of weeks of 
doing these exercises, wanted to share them. Now, when it comes to aesthetics, I didn't know what to do with it, but I thought to myself, can we paint the language? And I thought, because I'm influenced by Andrew Lyon, I thought to myself, well, we could paint the language, we just record intonation. And I'm just flagging these research um, projects to you and the research and the teaching tools or learning tools that we are creating for our students because I don't have enough time to do everything. But what we notice in, say, for example, con the context of academic writing or scientific writing, scientific paper writing, that the sentences are actually elaborate. They long, right? So very often we say to students, write short sentences, yes, but you know, you wouldn't want to see a text, uh, a, a scientific text that says, um, I've written the paper, secret, The Secret of Shaolin Monk. The paper was published in Uncall Journal. Anya Lyon and myself wrote that paper. It was about language learning. It would drive you nuts, right? So what, what I'm saying here is um, um, what research, what our research has shown, that actually we speak in chunks. The chunk is something that you say between the, you know, how long it will take you to say all the words before you take the next breath. So we actually have long sentences. They have five long chunks and each chunk has some smaller chunks. I will not introduce you to it much to that, but you can say it. We have five big chunks. So these are the Roman ones. And in every um, sort of sequence of longer chunk is uh, there's smaller chunks there. And when you actually reflect with students on this, and when you engage them in thinking about it, where is the grouping here? Where are those aesthetic processes that Ramachandran said? They will come up with their own solutions, right? They will say, oh, and maybe wrong ones, fine. But you engage students in reflection on what the research says. So now they don't think of a sentence like, um, you know, you use the connector and you use a comma here. What they are thinking is where is, how is, has the grouping, what groups are here? What, um, is there a balance here in this text? Is there, is there a metaphor here? Is there harmony? Is there a visual rhythm in those sentences, right? And they will, so you in, in, engage students in thinking about the processes which are familiar to their brain as opposed to, um, teaching them linguistic systems is quite different, right? And you as a teacher, maybe you will actually share with them your experiences of how you think of, uh, of the things, how this text is organized in terms of those aesthetic categories. You have a voice, but so do I. And you have this magical discussion and now they organize the information in the head about the text according to their own experiences and how they perceive it not according to some linguistic model that has nothing to do or very little to do with how people process the world. You know, terms in the, I just played today with these things. My PhD students, when they see this presentation, they will hate me because I've never shown them this one. But I thought to myself, when it, I mean, we, we looked at the concept of harmony and balance differently before symmetry. But if you look at this, this is a sentence from a science or re, scientific report. Look at this. The researchers recommend that risk averse people such as so there's an elaboration here and look at this on the bottom it's also such as and then they have or depression or talking to a stranger people who write well do these things automatically and it's us when we use those systems or categories from Ramachandran we can actually see where is the balance here where is the symmetry and I saw it I just was coloring these things differently and looking at the um uh, similarities in linguistic structures and coloring them and thinking, oh my God, this is so well holding, like in a bowl. Um, so, right, so um, here too, I found the same. So I'm just not taking you into the nitty gritty of this, but you can see here, this is a sentence on the left from an article, and this is the, uh, from an English uh, language learning article by Andrew Lyon. And here on the right, we have uh, the same uh, science report sentence. And look at this, it's exactly the same. It's together with an increase in the mobilities in red, and together it's like also, right? And on the bottom, he finishes as well as other languages. People do these things automatically. So it's very interesting to say, uh, reading for emotion. What we I'll just take it very quick, take it very quickly, and I'll finish here. What I did for the last twenty years or twenty five years of my life, I've been always thinking that there is a there is a uniform structure to all text, and I'm very happy to be challenged on it. But I think this pretty much summarizes what you have: focus, disturbance, dialogue, and all of that. 
Um, so I use this module as a universal, um, as a canon. Obviously, when you look at text, for whatever reason, sometimes uh, writers play with those categories. But when they play with these categories, these categories are still in place, and you can then see how the text changes in relation to those categories. It's very interesting to look at. So um, it's, it's a more powerful tool than, say, that this uh, text has a beginning, middle, and the end, right? You can't teach beginning, middle, and the end, but you can teach children or students how to actually generate a focus of a text, how to generate a problem, how to, uh, you know, create a discussion on its relevance. So, um, you know, um, I analyzed here a story by uh, an Aboriginal story, Aboriginal Australian story, on kangaroo and how the kangaroo got the pouch. So you can see it started sort of, oh, well, it didn't have a moral. So instead of having a moral, after the resolution, it went to disturbance. Sorry, so, and then it went again to disturbance, it went again to disturbance until it finished with the moral. We had other texts. There's an abstract here produced by an expert author. It started with the development, should have started with the focus. It didn't. But then it very quickly went into the... So it was development, development, and then it hit the focus, right? So the focus was in this mass market, these developments, even the person who wrote this abstract didn't know, but they were actually starting the paper, the abstract with the development phase, which I call, and they use the word development. It's amazing, right? So people play with those uh, categories, but anyway, you can with students, um, analyze text. You don't have to get it wrong. The very reflection, the very integration of those categories into a discussion about the structure of the text is enough to generate enough experiences by students to start making them more aware of the text structure. So nobody has to get it right, but just having a discussion going is great. Now, this is when it comes to emotions here. Look at this. this I'm just this is finishing now. Uh, so, then, um, so basically, so once so i showed you the the um the, the generic structure and then for each uh, uh, level of this of the text we analyze why the sentence is constructed this particular way and i ask my phd students the sentence which is on the top if you remove the colored words it is a perfectly good sentence, which is scientists say they have found evidence that sour tastes lead to more risk-taking behavior. Why the heck did they put all that other information? Right? So you can actually have a discussion on that. Not only this, you can also have a discussion. Why did they actually play with the grammar a little bit? Why did they say they have found for the first time empirical evidence instead of saying what i would have written in a neutral text not something that i would like to attract his attention to right so this is the clue i would have said you know the um the scientists say comma in a paper published right so where do they say it and then what do they say it right well they didn't do that they actually said they actually use a different word order or structure you could have a discussion why did they talk about the evidence that they found as opposed to where they actually said that why was this sort of thing happening here so the internet has plenty of lists of emotions and you can actually use those emotions and so i've got the list here this is positive and this is negative emotions you can actually use them and as students go through those emotions right they go like oh was it about being incapacitated or feeling blasé what was it what was it right they're learning these words without actually memorizing them right but every time we're asking them questions find the emotion why do you think you use that thing they actually by going through those they learn and also they build their emotional vocabulary and as a result they build their emotional self-awareness and once they have emotional self-awareness they become also emotionally aware of others which is that the the big um, generic capabilities that we want from our students when to demonstrate upon completion of our courses so my student after you know dying for half an hour in my office he said well they they use the word uh, um, science at the Su uh, sussex computer human uh, interaction lab he said they used it for uh, establishing credentials of those scientists right so to make the article more credible right so that the reader actually 
trust. So to connect with the reader in a way that develops trust to the findings. I thought very well, it took us half an hour, but not too bad, right, for the first go. So, um, right, so you can actually use those, uh, the concept of every text is an intention which is embedded in emotion by actually integrating the emotional justification of why we actually in, you know structure words uh, structure text in a particular way why we use those words not other words why we use a word order that way on right so i was hoping that through this uh, little presentation i might um be able to show to you how there is a lot of information out there. This is just glimpses which I showed you and how you can creatively think for yourself, uh, how to integrate that strange information and how to actually develop tools to enable the processes that neuroscience says we use to self-organize. Each of us is different because we self-organize according to our own uh, experiences. I hope it was useful for you. Thank you so much and I'm uh, looking forward to questions.